In this video, we are going to understand the architecture of ice and water. We'll dive into how we can change the way we imagine building process when we change the materials we use for construction. And for this, we'll be using Water Tribe's structure and architectural designs in Avatar The Legend of Aang and we'll be relating it to real world construction. But before that, as someone who likes building things, it's only natural we start by excavation and building the foundations before we erect the structure. Usually in modern times, the form of building we end up with is the result of the aggregated function of the building. Thus, we rarely end up with buildings that feel or look like a sculpture. And if you wish to make a building that resembles a sculpture, unfortunately you will end up with so many ambiguous or even dead spaces with no clue how to make any use of them. You would have to provide dead functions to dead spaces like a sitting area in the middle of nowhere. These would only end up being useless excuses that does not justify anything. So to find a balance between a building that is designed to look and feel like a sculpture, and one that provides efficiency for all the functions it needs to complete can be a very hard task for the designer to undertake. This is why we are studying and letting our imagination flow by trying to understand how buildings are made using water bending. Imagine somehow if our building material was water. Additionally, imagine if we also had the ability to control and contort the liquid into any shape and form and then harden it into ice right away. Maybe then we can somehow free the reins holding back our imagination and create shapes we could never imagine. So with all that said, we Avatar fans know that the adventure always starts from the water and that is where our journey begins today. The first place we are shown is a small village inhabited by the war-torn and scattered people of the Southern Water Tribe. This village doesn't have any particular name and it's just called Village. You can just listen to her. Ang, this is the entire village. Entire village, Ang. It's also the home of two of our heroes, Katara and her older, goofier brother Sokka. First time we see the Southern Water Tribe village, we can see the hints of their lifestyle. Living in a small village like that, each and everyone has to do everything that is necessary for survival. This includes hunting, cooking, making garments, teaching, caring for kids, healing and even building. Apart from the large igloo that probably acts as a multi-purpose communal building, we can see animal skin tents, which according to the wiki is made up of seal skin. The supporting structure it seems is a slender wood of some kind. In the previous image we also see a cross bracing of what it seems like wood to probably get some extra support against the wind. The southern water tribe's lifestyle seems to match that of Inuits and Eskimos to a certain extent compared to any other pole dwellers. Inuits lived in an igloo during the winter. Igloo is made up of compacted snow blocks rather than blocks of ice. As snow will have ear pockets in it that acts as an insulator and makes it a lot lighter to carry around than a solid block of ice. During the summer when the snow started melting, instead of an igloo, the Inuits lived in a sealskin tent called Tupic. The wood they used to support their tents were primarily coniferous pine or fir trees. The cover-up tents were also sometimes made using caribou hide. This shows how ingrained and dependent our architecture was to our lifestyle unlike today. Many Eskimo tribes were known for spear fishing, just like we see Sokka doing. Their diet was primarily composed of meat. This lifestyle of Inuits is quite similar to that of Southern Water Tribe Village than any other Arctic dwelling or Siberian tribes. We also need to remember that the village was a remnant of a once great nation of Southern Water Tribe. The cities of the Southern Water Tribe were destroyed during the Hundred Years of War incited by the Fire Nation. They were an easy target as the South Pole was close to the Fire Nation. Now the remaining tribes people are forced to live in small pockets of similar villages across the South Pole. We can see the men of the Southern Water Tribe are still holding a resistance against the Fire Nation with their small group of warriors who still battle away from the village. Long afterwards in Avatar The Legend of Korra, we see the revival of the Southern Water Tribe under the watchful eye of the sister tribe in the north and under the exiled tribesman who is also Avatar Korra's father. Here we see that the Southern Water Tribe has adapted to a more modern lifestyle. They have their own customs which differs from the more traditional northern tribe and this usually did tend to cause a rift time and again between the leaders of the two tribes. Their buildings at that period past the time of Avatar Aang seems to be a combination of different styles. They still have the large ice buildings just like in the north which we'll discuss later. Their residence seems to be made up of wood along with the decorative elements and in the town area we even see some modern materials like metal and glass. Southern Water Tribe also seems to be where a worldwide trading company is based thus they seem to have imported a lot from culture to people with them would come varying architectural styles and building materials. It is quite nice to see how the small pockets of village in the Southern Water Tribe has grown to become a vibrant center of culture and innovation. It shows the resilience of people and their ability to endure hard time and rise back up. We also see a pot of capitalism brewing which can be a topic for another time. Now we move all the way to the north. 
When we see the Northern Water Tribe for the first time at the end of book one, their civilization still holds and their culture is still intact. They have strict traditions and practices that have kept them strong through the trying times, but the same traditions also seem to make a divide between the men and the women of the tribe, not letting men or women choose a role that is outside the definition of their social practices. This has also known to cause much debate and dissatisfaction, but most people still live under the traditions and obey them inside the city itself. The majority of buildings we see in the northern tribe are made up of ice, from its huge walls and its massive castles all are made of ice. The outer walls and the exterior of the city it seems is controlled by the waterbenders as they use their bending to create the openings, the gates, ramps or stairs and give accesses to the people entering and exiting the city. Same applies for the vessels like ships and boats that are entering and exiting the city. Public buildings seem to have no panels to close the doors. Instead they have open doorways, maybe people use their bending to close the doors. But in a place where everyone knows how to bend water and ice, a door made of ice wouldn't be a very secure way of protecting your property. So I believe there was enough trust among the people to let their property be unguarded by closed walls or locked doors. In residentials, rather than solid doors, we see that they have curtains. These crimson colored curtains are seen in doors and the windows across the residential area. I'm not sure if the curtain are of animal hide or are open garment of some kind of animal fur. Could be something else entirely like dried meat jerky. During the night time, it seems they use something to close the curtains. From the plain view, it seems as if it is some sort of solid wooden board, but it could be animal hide or those curtains themselves stretched and nailed by something to make them look so. We also see them practice domestication of animals. The shed where Appa is kept is shared by these white looking snow buffaloes. We do see some wood where Princess Yuki leads Avatar Aang and Katara into the Koi Pond area to let Aang communicate with the spirits. What we have discussed till now in Northern Tribe are huge buildings made of ice. We humans have also built our share of ice buildings. Most of the times these are igloos. But nowadays we have started building bigger things. And if you don't know by now, prepare to be surprised. If you ever visit Quebec, Finland and Norway, there is a practice of building hotels made from ice. Sometimes even exclusively from ice, with no other materials used. These structures are much bigger than traditional igloos. The building process of this hotel is quite interesting as in some places every year a different set of sculptors, architects, engineers and craft person are selected based on a competition or skill to complete these amazing projects. The construction processes of this structure include compacting the ice into desired shape and sculpting using flame turrets or even hot water jets to melt off the ice and create striking forms and carvings. Of course, traditional sculpting equipment is also used along with drills, picks, chisels and hammers, the whole bunch. Molds and casing are also used to cast the ice into the desired shapes. Most rooms and hallways are made in a self-supporting arch shape, which part by part combines into the whole of the building. And in my eyes, this is ice bending in human scale. The Hotel of Ice or Hotel de Gloss in Quebec City of Canada takes around 32 days to complete and is built every year. In some places, these are erected seasonally during the colder times of winter, while in some places, these are functioning year-round and will take in guests throughout that time. In this seasonal and sometimes year-round tourist attractions, almost everything is made of ice. Apart from the building itself, the furniture to the decoration, even the utensils are made of ice. For me, the large ice palaces we can see in the North Pole in Avatar is more of a pure venture into the realm of imagination and artistry. Imagine if you could bend and control the shape of your buildings by using our mind. Many of us have already imagined this futuristic possibility. Maybe in future we could achieve this with intelligent nanotech buildings. But for now we can only imagine the waterbenders shaping the palaces and homes. I would imagine if building homes was such an easy task for waterbenders with just the spin of their hands, then art, sculpture and storytelling should be much more prevalent in their homes. As this would be the only way they could show off their homes to each other and tell their individual stories to the people around them. This is in complete contrast to the sister tribe in the South Pole. They still live a semi-nomadic lifestyle when we see them the first time with their construction giving us all the hint. Although they seem to have settled in their current location for quite a while. In my opinion, they moved there after Katara's mom died in the attack by the Fire Nation. It would make no sense to me if a small village like that stayed in the same place after being brutally attacked and decimated by the Fire Nation. There were probably other reasons for this nomadic lifestyle like food and resources. But in this situation, I'm sure it's due to them having to evade Fire Nation time and again. With this, I conclude the first chapter of the architecture of the Avatar verse. Stay tuned for Earth, Fire and Air and maybe more if more things come up. Till then, hope you learned something today and don't let your imagination be frozen. As a great man once said, be like water. Melt, flow, freeze and evaporate into whatever you desire. And for now, let's get back to exploring.
So, Fry, was the real moon anything like the moon you used to dream about? 